Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth um, Jackson Insight Group study session where this month we are um, not only excited but really truly honoured to be discussing um, the wonderful man that is on your screen, Bruce Redeen, who sadly passed away um, on the November the 16th. Um, we actually decided about two months ago to, to study this book. It was a really popular one um, amongst the book club group. And um, we were so keen to, to get started. So we did start it about four or five weeks ago. And, um, you know, very quickly kind of felt like we were getting into this relationship with Bruce and really starting to find out about his story and, you know, kind of what a genius he was. And then obviously we got the, the terribly sad news that he'd passed away. Um, and it just made us really want to not only research him further, but also... Um, really kind of put everything that we had into, um, you know, making a, a nice tribute for him and kind of getting his legacy and, and his message out there. So hopefully we, we do that justice this evening. Um, Angie, I think you're going to share a few um, tributes that have come out about him a bit later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and how have you that. found this month studying Bruce? Yeah, I mean... As you just said, I think, you know, we obviously started it. We didn't know that he was even ill. Um, and I think all three of us, you know, through our dialogues, we were sort of falling in love with him, his relationship with B, and his just basically absolute love and ador adoration for Michael. And there's others that obviously like Quincy that he did. But um, I think with him, that there's no sort of controversy surrounding him. And his, his book is just a beautiful tribute to Michael. It's, it's obviously more of a technical um, book for the industry, but I think it's got lovely stories in there of Michael, of his life with B. And I just think we started to sort of get to know him. So it was quite a shock to then find out he was ill and then sadly he passed while we were doing this. It seemed a little bit strange as we were just sort of learning more about him. So, but re really, really nice book and really nice man. Yeah, it, it certainly did feel... Well, it certainly does feel a little bit serendipitous how this has all happened, really. And, um, you know, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to discussing him this evening. I just hope that, that we do him and, and the amazing book that we've read, Justice. Nicole, you've done a lot of research on him this month. You've um, watched a lot of documentaries, listened to various podcasts. How have you found the journey with Bruce this month? Well, I, th I think your phrase of it being a bit of an emotional roller coaster is probably the the best description because, as Angie said, we were all sort of so excited to be learning about him and kind of, you know, falling in love with him. And then we heard the sad news. And so that was, you know, quite a shock because we'd spent weeks watching documentaries and, and listening to podcasts and reading all about him. So it has been a bit of a roller coaster, like a bit of an emotional journey this month. So I'm just um, really glad that we get to to sort of pay tribute to him tonight and um, and discuss him in the depth that he should be discussed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually found out, I think the majority of, of us um, fans found out about his passing from the beautiful words that were posted on Facebook by his daughter. And um, Angie, have you got any of those words as part of your sort of tribute? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So it was a post by his daughter, as you say, Roberta, and also on behalf of his wife, B. Um, and she posted that my dad, Bruce Swidian, um, passed away peacefully last night, November 16th. He was 86, a legend in the music industry for over 65 years and five-time Grammy, Grammy winner. He was known for his work with Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson and many more. He had a long um, life full of love great music, big boats, and a beautiful marriage. We will celebrate that life. He was loved by everyone. Rest in peace, dear Daddy J Jai. We love you forever, B and Roberta. So I think that was just a lovely um, tribute and to him. Well, obviously, two yes. women, very special in his life, um, which I know we're going to cover later. Um, just on some of the other tributes, I mean, Sadia Garrett, she posted a lovely tribute to him saying really there was no words to express how sad she was at losing a dear friend. 
um, who has been with me from the beginning of my career, sending love, prayers and condolences to his wife B, daughter Roberta and to his fans around the world. Brucey, you will never ever be gone from our hearts. And she also, if you go onto her Facebook page or Instagram page, she post posted a lovely um, personal video that she had of actually going around his studio and which has also been called by others as sort of a museum. So there's some really nice sort of footage there and you know seeing him again always so lovely and friendly as he was. Another tribute um, was coming in from Quincy Jones and he said he was absolutely devastated to learn the news that we'd lost my dear brother in arms, the legendary Bruce Swidian. There were not enough words to express how much Bruce meant to me. He was without question the absolute best engineer in the business. Um, Brad Sundberg also, he, he relayed a, a quite sweet story called um, Never Be Late, which included him sort of being slightly told off by Bruce for being late to one session, the only session that he ever slept with, and sort of given that, uh, you know, both sides to him where, you know, he, he made you do the best you could ever do and he um, said that he'd never been late again and he also shared um, a podcast which um, we've listened to which again we'd recommend you know anybody have listened to that which has got some nice stories about Bruce um, there's also it was reported in the BBC New York Times Washington Post and um, also the Michael Jackson estate paid tribute to him. I think in most tri tributes that were in the media, you saw them pick up mainly on Quincy's um, sort of uh, memorial to him. And also obviously a lot of them uh, spoke of him with his connection to Michael and his work with Michael has obviously been the key one that most people um, know him for. So there were some nice tributes there. I think sadly some of the others that he's worked with that probably would have given great tributes are around no longer so um you know there wasn't as many people to maybe make those tributes to bruce but some nice ones there and some amazing ones from from the fans as well um i know just on the mjbc group there were just hundreds and hundreds of of messages of condolences and of you know sharing their love for bruce and you know, not only how much he did for Michael, but actually recognising Bruce as, as his own entity and the genius that he was and, and the legacy that he left on the music industry. So they were really beautiful to read too. Um, before we start discussing the book, which we're really excited to dive into this today, um, I think Nicole's got um, a nice sort of introduction into, into Bruce and and kind of who he was and, and what he achieved in his amazing um, lifetime. So Nicole, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us to start, please. Uh, Bruce Swedean was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1934. His parents, both classically trained musicians, instilled in him a love and passion for music that in Bruce's own words, left a permanent impression on me. Bruce considered himself lucky to have parents who showed him how music should sound and taking him by taking him to live music regularly and in particular to orchestras. For his 10th birthday, Bruce received a recording machine from his father and he knew then that recording was what he wanted to do with his life. In high school, Bruce met B and what ensued was a wonderfully loving relationship and more than 65 years of marriage. After setting up his own recording studio in Minneapolis, Bruce moved to Chicago where he learned from the best, Bill Putnam. Bruce went on to become the best, working with the biggest names in the industry including Duke Ellington, Dinah Washington, Frankie Valley, Count Basie, Barbara Streisand, Roberta Flack, Donna Summer, Diana Ross, Jennifer Lopez, and so many more, including the greatest of them all, Michael Jackson. Bruce was a masterful technician and a pioneer and innovator in his field. He loved to teach and passed on his knowledge with the motto, I have no secrets, and of course, music first. Bruce's list of accolades and achievements is extensive, including 13 Grammy nominations and five Grammy wins, three of which were Michael Jackson albums. Sadly, Bruce passed away this month on November 16th at age 86. With over 60 years in the recording business, Bruce leaves behind a legacy of recording music to the highest sonic quality. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, they're beautiful words for, for a fantastic man. I think it leads us in nicely actually to our first discussion point, which is uh, where we're going to talk about Bruce the man. Who was he? You know, putting kind of his um, career aside for a little bit, um, you know, kind of talking about his relationships in particular with B, which I feel like we could dedicate a whole show to. 
and I think that um, in addition to learning all the kind of anecdotes and stories about Bruce and Michael, um, I think the thing that we all probably spoke about almost more than his relationship with Michael was his relationship with B and how special that was. And um, I think that's kind of played a big part in in how we've kind of got to know Bruce and, and this image that we now kind of have of him. Um, so I actually have a really lovely picture to share. Um, Nicole, would you like to, to talk about your, your feelings of Bruce and B and kind of what you've learned and the, the image, I guess, that what we have learned kind of conjures up for us of this amazing couple? Um, I think the first the first thing that stands out to me is the um, documentary that we watched, um, the producers' room with the, the special with Bruce, um, and B was on there as well. And just to watch them together, I suppose, was sort of the the biggest eye opener for that for their special connection that they had. Um, I, this particular documentary, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was 2016 that they did that one. Um, so Bruce would have been 82. So um, a few times he wasn't sure about a couple of things. He couldn't remember specific details um, and he would constantly refer to B throughout this documentary. And it was just so lovely to see that connection. And you could obviously see that B had been such a huge part of his career because she had all the details. She knew all the information um, and he he sort of never missed an opportunity to sort of um, show his gratitude to her and the support that that um, she had given him over the years. It was just lovely to see them um, sort of together, I suppose, in, in that documentary and all through our reading and, and podcasts um, throughout the book. Anyone that's read it, you'll there's a heaps of sections in the book from people he's mentored and uh, the people that wrote the, the different sections in the beginning. And even though they're all mostly focusing on the work, almost every single one mentions B. So it's just so lovely to see that he had that strong connection and even those he worked with felt connected to her because of, because of their connection. I know you, um, you mentioned, Nicole, about um, kind of different um, colleagues and stuff, right? And I mean, pretty much all of them at some point in their kind of tribute, I guess, to Bruce. Um, is you know that they they have to mention B because she was kind of always present he kind of took her to to all of the recording sessions where if he was traveling she always went and um, I really loved a quote by John Jennings that says I'll never forget talking with a slightly morose Bruce during a session I said you're missing B aren't you and he replied John she's my life more than his beloved music the center of Bruce's life is his love story with B and I just loved that so much. And the fact that as well, you know, I mean, this was like, this was a guy born in the 1930s. Um, you know, I mean, in theory, he should have been this kind of old fashioned guy who would never, you know, men in those days didn't really express themselves in that way, you know, about their wife. And um, he was never afraid to to speak openly like that about her and at every opportunity every every documentary i've I've watched every podcast I've listened to absolutely numerous times in this book um, it's like any opportunity he can to speak about her he kind of grabs that with both hands and I just think that's so beautiful um, Angie, did it pull on your heartstrings yeah I mean absolutely like I said at the beginning it is Basically, this, I think this is the fairy tale we're all after. This is the Disney kind of thing with their relationship. Um, it, as you said, I mean, he come, she comes into everything. So if you read the book, she's in the book. She's in every sort of podcast, every documentary. A lot of the time he's got her there. Um, you know, you can just see is that support. And he said at one point, I think I wrote down a quote saying, you know, I knew it would be important to include her in one of the podcasts um, he mentioned. And also, I think in that producer's room documentary, um, one of the questions where they're just sort of doing quick fire, silly questions at the end, they ask about what superpower. And it goes to B to answer it. And she said, well, to live forever, I think that sort of basically says you've had a good life and he said mine would be to live forever with this lady um and I actually just think with his passing I almost feel like 
he had to go first. I don't think he could have coped without her. And I think that's quite clear. She was sort of his everything. Obviously loved his daughter, but he just speaks continuously about his wife. And he talks about, obviously, those in the industry um, saying, you know, you never invite your wife into the studio. He didn't understand why they would think that at all. She was every part of that. And also he makes, you know, mention of things like, her helping with certain lyrics, writing lyrics, because she had beautiful handwriting, um, you know, and obviously she really worked well with him about his career because he said, you know, it isn't a career that had easy hours. Um, she was obviously understanding and part of that. So, you know, that obviously helped him in that support. And when they started out as teenagers and he started in this industry, he said that, you know, they didn't have any money, but she supported him buying these microphones, which obviously he's now known for some of the biggest collection of microphones. So he said, you know, you pour all your money into this stuff. And she obviously supported that too. So I think they just had a real love of everything and everything together. So I think it was really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, like you say, he, she, she wasn't just so involved in terms of emotionally supporting him. I mean, she was really quite involved in in his work. Um, and I know on page 149, he says, I always play my recordings and mixings, mixes for her before anyone else has heard them. Um, and, you know, I think he obviously really trusted her her ear and her her sort of instinct and her feelings about the music more than you know arguably more than the artist or the other kind of producers and engineers so I think that says a lot um, and I did just want to read um, a section of, of what he wrote about B on pages I'm going to kind of uh, mix two quotes together on pages 148 149 because I think this just really sums up um, in a couple of paragraphs how he how he felt about B and how important she was to him when there is a major event in my life, I don't feel that it has actually happened until I tell B about it or until she has participated in the occasion. I've made it a habit to include her in all that I'm involved in. I don't go anywhere without her. I'm a terrible traveller. In addition, I'm not my favourite compa uh, companion. If I have B with me, I'm always happy and seem to have a very good time. I think B is the best person I know or ever will know for that matter. I've never had a vision of what we would be together, but I do know that what we mean to each other is vastly more than what either of us could have imagined when we first met. B is the light of my life. She is like sunlight, bright and warm, making everything seem clear. She is the most real woman I have ever known. I think that for sorry, I think that for that very reason she has made me into a real man. And I think that was such a beautiful couple of paragraphs to, to talk about B. Um, we hear quite a lot in the book and again through our other research that he had some other loves in his life, um, animals being one and food being another one. So he wants to take that on first. Well, I, I was just thinking those things myself um, and interesting when I was reading a lot of these to, to, well, to see that the things that he loved and how he must have had a fair bit in common with them. Um, with Michael in that way, with his love of animals, in particular his his dog. Um, I can't remember where I where I read it. If it was in the book, I think it's in the book where he talks about whenever he starts work, before he can start doing anything, he has to put his photos up. Um, and of course, there's a photo of B, but also a photo of their Great Dane. <laughs> so that, that love of animals, and and apparently he was um, therefore quite accepting of some of the. Um, quite exotic animals that Michael would bring into the studio. <laughs> um, but um, on many occasions, again, reading or hearing about his love of good food and good wine. Um, and Brad Sundberg even um, mentioned in the podcast I listened to just what a great sense of humour he had. Um, so, and I, I read a quite another quote, which I thought sort of summed Bruce up quite well, a big man with a big heart. Yeah. 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 I think that was um, John Jennings as well who said that. And um, Tommy Barler said, what a loving, devoted man this is. And that's just, you know, whoever you kind of, um, obviously not speak to directly, we were we weren't fortunate enough to be able to do that. But, um, you know, we have read a lot of words and tributes by different people and they all really do 
paint him in the same way. And that's how you know that someone's genuine when, when so many different people say the same thing over and over again about somebody, then you know that's, that's who they really were. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved with the, the food, I loved um, that someone kind of grasped him up in the book and said that he would order two giant, I don't know what Taylor the pup is, I don't know if that's like a brand, I think they're from like a hot dog store, right? Um, but he'd have two giant chili dogs with fries for lunch every day doing Michael <laughs> sessions. That that made me laugh. Um, Angie, what did you feel about, or what did you get from the book about um, sort of his uh, <laughs> other loves in life, let's say? Yeah, I mean, same as what you're saying here. The main things that come along are B, food, his uh, love of obviously music and animals. And I think in the producer's room, um, the, the guy that's interviewing him says, you know, this place is surrounded by animals or we might even have a chicken walk through here. And he's like, I don't mind. Um, so yeah, and, and one thing sort of B says is, oh, he puts up with me and my horses. And he's like, I love the horses. Obviously we know about Max and I think something we brought up last month when we were doing the genesis of Thriller was about the fact that they tried to use Max for the howling in in Thriller. So, you know, even trying to incorporate his animals in that. Um, Reading about the fact that, uh, I think this is what you were alluding to, Nicole, like muscles being on the soundboard. And it sounds like Bruce was quite protective of anybody on his soundboard. If anybody, some story about, you know, somebody went to touch something and he was like, you don't touch that. But obviously the steak was okay to be on his soundboard, even if humans were allowed with it. So, um, yeah, I, I can imagine obviously him and Michael were having a huge uh, sort of that, that shared love of animals and being able to talk about that. But food does come up a lot. Um, the ones that you mentioned, and I think Brad in his mentions about some burgers, because I think he said a lot of um, record industry people, you know, would be ordering from all these posh places um but Bruce always just wants to sort of order in the burger and there's the story about oh he'd he'd eat a bite and then be stuffed dribbling down and he's doing a bit of mixing so um and when you mentioned Nicole it was in the book where it said about the photo of B it was that kind of briefcase with the photos and then also came out the snacks so they were clearly very very consistent and I think that's like you've said Emma you and no matter what you heard, all the same things came. It was very, very consistent. So you can tell, obviously, that the same things about him were clear to everyone. And also that he was just a very sort of consistent man. So um, I think it was, it was clear on his love of food. I think it was in the book as well. And they bring up about the fact, um, I can't remember what they call them, the something twins. It's the chefs from Neverland. Slam, and they, dunk, slam dunk sisters. Yeah, slam dunk sisters. That's it. And then sort of coming in, Michael, you know, get them in on a Friday night and they'd make this roast. And he was saying, oh, Michael loved roast. It was like his favourite meal. And they would have that. It was like a big family eating. And it's clearly, I think, it's that experience with food, you know, sort of, I suppose, for America's like Thanksgiving and us for Christmas. It's kind of, he sees it all as very much a love. Um, You know, and he talks about Quincy being a great chef and that if he hadn't been what he was, he would have made a great chef. So again, lots of food things coming through everything. Yeah, I think that, sorry, Nicole, go on. I was just going to add, you know, if we're discussing all the things about Bruce the man, and I think that um, two things for me that came clear through a lot of different avenues as well is the fact that he was so hardworking. Um, But because of his passion, to him it wasn't work. And you saw him mention it a a few times um, in various places um, in the Silent Giants podcast. He talks about how he couldn't wait to get to the studio every day. Um, And you just, you do it till it gets done. So that perfectionist sort of side to him and the hardworking side, but how he didn't really see it as work. Um, And obviously he had that in common with with Michael as well. Um, And that kind of... Those, those two elements, that hardworking side and that perfectionist side, I think um, has to be mentioned in this section about who he was as a person as well. Yeah, I, I, I um, remember on that, I think you're saying on the Silent Giants, and I think it came up in a few things, he basically yeah. says, I retired at 15 years old. When he's asked, so when will you retire? He's like, oh, I retired at 15 years old. Because to him, it wasn't work, it was love. 
Um, so that was when he, you know, he fell. And I think in the book he mentions about a niece back in Sweden who says, "Oh, uncle, when are you going to retire?" And um, he says, "Well, retirement is traveling the world and doing things you love. Well, that's what I've been doing all the time." So, in, in like you say, he never saw himself as doing that, and he was really hardworking because he absolutely loved it and certainly had the perfectionism that that Michael had and appreciated that in Michael. And um, that comes across a lot, doesn't it? I think it's that old saying, you know, if you do something you love, you never work a day in your life. And I think that's how kind of Bruce saw his, mm. his life and his work, really. He just had such a passion for it. You know, he probably couldn't believe that he got paid to do it. You know, it's something that he would have done anyway, regardless of where the money was coming in. Um, yeah. I always, I mean, obviously Quincy wrote the foreword for, for this book and um, I think it's very telling actually how, how much Quincy thinks of, of Bruce because, um, you know, we need to remember that not only did they, they work together, obviously, you know, quite a lot over a number of years, but they did, they, they did actually live together for, for close to a year and a half uh, when they were working on the Wiz. They, they, they lived with each other in um, in a hotel, and uh, you know, so someone who's actually lived with the guy for a year and a half, which is a long time, um, and someone who still comes out singing their praises and pretty much doesn't have a bad word to say, um, you know, I think that that's very telling as well. I did like it when Rod Temperton in his section, um, he said he can be awkward yet patient, eccentric yet conservative. And occasionally a royal pain in the ass with Bruce <laughs> and no bullshit. And I think as well, that's going to obviously be spoken about a little bit more in, you know, when we actually delve into his work. Um, but, you know, if we were to kind of summarise Bruce and, and who he was just to kind of finish up this first section, um, it did seem to be someone who, you know, didn't take any crap, but at the same time, you know, he was so loving, so generous so hard working and kind of really really um did everything that he could for other people and did everything that he could to ensure that they succeeded and achieved and he would give all of, of himself to ensure that that happened um but i suppose because of all that he gave he kind of demanded the respect for that and um you know, was, was kind of assertive when he needed to be. So, um, yeah, that was great. Okay, discussion point number two. Um, so, obviously this book, um, before I started reading this book, what I kept hearing from a few different people is that it's quite a technical book. And for some people, it kind of almost put them off reading it. Um, and so I was actually really pleasantly surprised because um, while there are obviously elements of, well, obviously there's quite a lot in terms of how he recorded, it, but I really thought, okay, this is obviously a book where I'm not going to understand what's going on. And, and actually quite a lot of it, he explains in, in such a way that, that kind of novices like us really did start to understand. And it was really fascinating to be able to see how Michael's music amongst others, but obviously we're most interested in Michael and, and how his music and songs were actually built. And um, so I was really appreciative of that because I think if, if a lot of other people tried to, to explain that or write about it in a book, I think he, he kept in mind that there were going to be amateurs who are reading this book. Um, and he did for, for a lot of it actually explain it in, in layman's terms. But I mean, it was so fascinating to read some of these techniques. You know, I, I know nothing about recording music or sound engineering but um you know we i think we all learned a hell of a lot from this book i mean there's stuff on here that i've written in my notes um that you know like a month or two ago if, if, i mean this looks like a different language but now <laughs> you kind of have a little bit of a well, i'm not saying i could run a seminar on it but you know you start to get a little bit of a of an understanding and um it's actually been really fascinating um, so should we start by talking about his absolute like next love in life, which is obviously the microphones? Oh, how many pages were dedicated to microphones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I'm quite so unbelievable. 
I'm surprised he never wrote a book just on microphones. <laughs> Well, of course, the other the, the book that we didn't read, although we did watch the the documentary on it. Um, but of of course, there was um, the recording method, uh, which I'm sure he does probably go into a lot more detail in that book. But I think that probably would go over our heads. So, um, um, yes, yeah, and really, really um, interesting. I mean, I'm not going to again make out like I understood everything that he wrote about microphones. There were some things that that did go over my head, but um, you know, he did just he did sort of give some good explanations of of the different microphone choices what each one would be used for um really really found interesting his explanations of of how microphones were used in terms of um you know sort of putting a, a vocalist to cro um, close proximity of the microphone to get a certain sound moving them away from the microphone to get another sound um using shields um, the placement, I mean, one of the things actually in his documentary, um, recording Bruce Swedeen, um, that I found really fascinating was he was demonstrating, and, and by the way, if you have read the book, but you haven't seen the documentary that we're referring to, I'd really recommend it because what you're able to do is kind of put into a visual sense what you're reading. Um, yeah, and it really kind of shows a lot of the, the techniques that he talks about. Um, but it was really fascinating to see how different the sound is uh, from a microphone with just the slightest change. You know, if, if the microphone is just tilted very, very slightly either way, the sound was really completely different. And even just that alone made me respect his, his work and his knowledge and his expertise even more because I just had no idea. I mean, that's probably quite a basic thing, but like I said, I, I'm, I don't know anything about this you know this this line of, of work um and so yeah it just made me really have a more of a respect i think for, for what he did and and for for his knowledge and his expertise um nicole would you mind giving a little bit of an explanation on the xy pairing technique <laughs> if you don't mind i'm going to throw that one out well i I I'm admit, well, as you were saying, you start reading the book and he starts talking about some of these techniques. And at first I was a bit like, oh dear, I don't know if I understand this. And certainly that documentary does help you to see it as a visual. Um, and one of the things that comes very clear when you start looking at anything with Bruce is stereo. Um, he goes, he says it all the time, talks about the importance of stereophonic images in, in the recording. Um, and then, of course, he is very, very um, explicit about the fact that you can't just double a mono sound, that stereo is very different to that. So at first I was reading those things and thinking, I don't really understand what this means. So I did some extra reading. And of course, it's to do with the way that he records things. And the, um, the XY pairing essentially takes two microphones and they have to be, I feel like I need props to explain this, but oh, there we go, there's a picture. <laughs> so essentially taking the two microphones and they're placed at 90 degree angles from each other and they have to be as close as they can be to each other without touching so that that way the sounds come to them at, at almost the same time um, because of the placement, obviously it's slightly different. And that's able to create more more depth in the recording and he also speaks about how um, he would combine stereo and mono of the same thing and mix them together and that's how he was able to create the richness and the warmth in a lot of his recordings um, he speaks about this technique a lot i think i read in was it in the book that he says it's his absolute favorite technique um, and so he obviously mentions it quite a bit um, that I, I found that fascinating um, and particularly in the documentary where you get to see him set it up and then he actually plays um, you, you get to hear the difference in variation when when he does, does slight shifts of those microphones and I found it interesting as well Emma when he was talking about the angle of the microphones mm -hmm. and talking about how certain microphones in certain positions for certain frequencies and just a slight angle uh, I think he said it was, might have been talking about ribbon microphones. I might have that wrong, but he, when you put it on a slight angle, it means that you um, you alter the the lower frequencies. You're blocking out the lower frequencies. So obviously, just all of those things you start to read about them, and 
again, I couldn't run a seminar, but I have a bit of an understanding of them. And it just really gives you this appreciation for, for what he did. And the sounds that we're hearing in music, um, why, you know, a lot of us are obviously drawn to Michael Jackson music, but essentially that sonic quality that we're hearing is all Bruce. And so I really, after this whole month, I'm having, I've got this newfound appreciation for the recording process and obviously his knowledge and his expertise that went into that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think um, it's definitely fair to say, and I think that after you've researched Bruce and these techniques, um, you feel a little bit more comfortable saying that, you know, Michael's albums would not be what they were without Bruce. And um, I know that, you know, some fans, they get a little bit um, defensive of, of Michael when we say things like that. And, but I think, you know, for Bruce, you have to, you have to acknowledge that because, you know, that sound quality, you know, we're talking, again, we're going to be talking about Thriller more later on in particular, but, um, you know, we forget that a, a lot of Michael's albums included sounds, particularly Thriller, that people had never heard before. And yes, Michael was definitely a part of that process and a lot of the ideas came from Michael, but, you know, Bruce was the, the genius behind the mixing boards and, and he was the one that was able to really um, kind of balance the sounds um, to get those unique sounds, um, you know, sounding. The clarity as well. Exactly, yes. But I think it's important to add to what you just said I completely completely agree with you that we wouldn't have that quality without Bruce, but Bruce would probably say, and and he he does say this. Um, I forget where I've I've looked at too many things, <laughs> but he says that Michael's uh, Michael brought out the Michael's music brought out his best work. Michael yes. inspired that in him, so he was inspired and he was allowed the creativity to. To, to do his best work. And I think, um, and we'll talk about this topic, I think a bit more next month in um, when we do King of Style, but Michael had this ability to inspire others and to bring out the creativity in others. And I think Bruce sort of attests to that um, when he talks about Michael bringing that out of him. Um, yeah. And as well, he, he talks about, um, one of my favorite stories is, um, when he's talking about microphones, there's a little YouTube clip and we'll, we'll put all of our links together for everybody, but there's a little YouTube clip where um, Bruce is presenting to um, a masterclass or at a university, I'm not sure where, and he, he plays for them um, the way you make me feel and he takes the original, or the actual mix that was used on the album and he just mutes all the tracks except for the vocals. So you're just hearing Michael's voice, which is in incredible to listen to but after that he's talking about the techniques involved in the microphone he used etc um and he he says oh well just about any chimpanzee could record michael <laughs> so i think um he um obviously he's not giving himself enough credit there but at the same time he's trying to to show what my point is that um michael brought out his best work but also you know it was the two of them together that 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 brought out the best in each other, I suppose, in that way. And yeah. I suppose if we're, sorry, Angie, but if we're going to be fair, we have to mention Quincy as well, because I think, I think all three of them, that is exactly what they did. They, they all brought the, out the best in each other. And I think that's an excellent point to make. Um, but I think all three of them contributed their own bit into creating these unbelievable albums. And they all kind of contributed something different and, you know, put together, they were just, you know, a match made in heaven, really. Sorry, Andrew, well, what were you going to say? No, you're, you're right. <laughs> Just on that point, I think, I think you're right, isn't it? There's three people together who were absolute experts in their fields. And one thing that Bruce said, I mean, he, you don't really ever hear him say negatives about people. I think you hear more by his absence, maybe on certain points, that you get, get what he thinks. And there's a very small bit that he talks about Prince. Um, and he said about, oh, but Prince wants to be the recording artist, the producer, the mixer and everything. And I think by that, what he was trying to say is, if you don't let the people who are great in their field do it, it, it won't be quite as, you know, good as, as something like Thriller because 
you're getting the geniuses in each field and I think they all learn from each other. He certainly credits Quincy and Michael for a lot and I'm, you know, Quincy credits it back and I'm sure obviously Michael would, would say the same about Bruce. So I think there is a lot of it there. On his, on his mics, I've just got one quote that was from his own Facebook page, which was, my microphone collection spanning many of the best known models in studio history are my pride and joy. My microphones are prized prize possessions and to me they are irreplaceable. Having my own mics that no one else handles or uses assures a consistency in the sonics of my work, which would otherwise be impossible. And I think on the Brad Sundberg um, sort of a tribute to Bruce. There's a story in there about an accident that's happened with, with the mics, but luckily because Bruce insists on them all being packaged on their own individually in great big, you know, wads of, of this sort of protective packaging that they, they survive. And they certainly were his pride and joy. He's been offered lots of money for certain mics and, you know, he's never wanted to, to sell them. And on that sort of thing, there's a whole list again of all these different mics. And one thing he does say is, you could use any microphone on Michael, it didn't really matter. But he does mention a certain mic on, um, if you listen to Smile and Childhood, I think he says he uses this um, N N Newman U47. And, he's, and on, for both of those songs, you hear him in a number of documentaries saying, T turn the lights out, listen to it. I'll give you ten dollars if you, you know, if you're not crying, sort of once you listen to it. And you know, he's really got an appreciation of Michael's talent, and there's a lot that he discusses about how he prepared he was and everything um, when he came to the studio. So there's a real appreciation there. But he certainly, in his field, you know, that that's it. He was a genius. I think years ago, when I was younger, listening to records, I would never even thought about really what does he add to it. What I found interesting with this book is um, on, on elements, if I didn't quite understand research at the same time, but also listening to the songs he's talking to as you're reading it. So the one he's talking about, listening to actually what he's referring to. And then one of the things I did when he was talking about the depth, so he talks about how he managed to put sort of depth in the music that really isn't there and in his recording methods. One thing I did was I went back to some songs from the 80s that are, you know, big hits, big stars, and listened to them compared to when you listen to Thriller, and you can you can hear it. You're almost hearing the others in your ears here, but it's like, it's almost when you listen to anything that Bruce has been involved with, you're hearing it all around. It is literally over your head, and you can feel like you're in the middle of it. And I think that's what, in a lot of it, he's trying to describe that he gets. And, you know, he, a bit like Michael, where they maybe play down their own genius, they maybe play down their own um, amount of hard work in picking up technical things. Bruce certainly had that. But you also get that he, his thing, like Michael, is a lot about the love of it and the passion of it, because that's where he always says music first, you must go listen to live music to be able to record it. Don't listen to records to work out how to record it. Listen to live music. And that's what you're capturing. And I think where he sort of let Michael, you know, move while he was recording, where other people may not have allowed that, wanted the artist to stand still and to just capture the crispness of the voice. He allowed him, you know, and he'd stand him on that drum um, bass so that wooden bass and let him sort of stomp away with his feet and dance as he's recording and it captured you know a, a different thing than maybe somebody else would so I think you're right in what you're saying I think the music would obviously still been amazing from Michael but it wouldn't have been the same and if you listen to those recordings Michael's recordings from the 80s they listen to some of the great music from the 80s. The quality doesn't stand up quite to the test of time that Michaels do. They do sound like they've literally been recorded yesterday. And that's what I really did when listening to it. I did lots of comparisons like that to really see what he was discussing and talk about. And you can really tell the difference. They, they do sound still very new. And others, you can hear that sort of dated sound to them. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've heard... I've heard people time and time again say that Thriller sounds like it, you know, it's recorded yesterday. And, and I used to think that that was linked to the actual songs because the songs themselves, they don't, they don't seem like 80s songs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I started to, 
to read about how it was recorded. Um, like you, you know, I listened to some 80s music and it is just on a, on, on a different level and it literally does sound like it was recorded in a modern studio, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's, it's remarkable really. Um, a couple of uh, microphone quotes that, or anecdotes I should say, that I really enjoyed reading. Um, John Jennings tells of how they asked Bruce to advertise one of his favourite microphones and when the advert went out they couldn't keep the microphones on the shelves and you know this is reflective of, of the respect that the industry had for Bruce's opinion um, and expertise so you know he comes out and says oh well you know I think this is the best microphone ever and, and that's it that's enough for, to make that that microphone sell out and um, the other one was um, I found it really interesting. He mentioned this a couple of times in his book. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing this correctly. I think it's the Newman microphones. Yeah. So we had two of them. Um, and one was stolen during the thriller sessions that he never recovered. Um, but he still owned one. And it was really fascinating that he paid $390 for it. But he said he, um, at one point, he turned down an offer 30 times more than what he paid. So again, I think that's representative of how highly people thought of him and, and his work and the fact that this microphone, I, I guess maybe it's the idea that the micro, it's the microphone that had done the amazing work rather than Bruce, but the fact that people, A, were willing to steal one and B, were willing to, to pay 30 times $390, you know, just for these microphones that Bruce owned and used. Um, I think I, I, him too. I actually I, I, I calculated what that was and I can't remember the figure now, but I think it was like around the eleven thousand mark. But on a wow. on a documentary or a, I think it was a podcast from two thousand and eighteen that I listened to, he actually said he'd been offered twenty thousand dollars for wow. the for the microphone and he turned it down. He says, No way I'm ever selling that. So yeah, he obviously loved that particular microphone. But I just wanted to share another thing from um it was a, a Vinyl Nights podcast that I listened to. I'm not sure if either of you listened to that one. And that's with um J.R. Robinson, who's quite a well known drummer. I didn't know who he was until I looked him up from the podcast. Um, but he on, on Wikipedia, if this is accurate, I'm not sure, but it does say that he's one of the most recorded drummers in history. Um, so he must be on a few different things, but anyway, he, the podcast goes for about an hour and he's talking to Bruce about lots of different things, but obviously percussion and, and drumming comes up a fair bit because that's his background. Um, he's the drummer on, um, rock with you, you know, at the start, you hear the, you hear the beats mm -hmm. at the start. So that's him. Um, so they were talking about some of Bruce's techniques with regard to drumming. Um, and some of the things that came up were things like, um, that Bruce insisted on putting a barrier between the hi-hat and the snare. Well, I'm not a drummer and I don't know the way that drums are set up, but JR goes on to explain how essentially you had to completely alter your technique to move around this barrier to be able to hit between those two sections of your drum kit. Um, and eventually Bruce said he changed from a piece of ply. He used a bar uh, initially it was a piece of ply as a barrier and then he figured out that a ping pong paddle worked better. <laughs> so he used to carry a ping pong paddle with his in his array of gear to, to set that up between these two pieces of equipment. Um, and obviously he would mic them all in his technical ways. And that um, JR was saying how difficult it was because he completely had to alter his technique. Um, and the other thing Bruce made him do was that usually if you were playing you know, if you're playing forte, you're playing loud, you would hit every drum loud. If you're playing soft, you would hit every drum soft. But Bruce said, that's not how we need to record it. In the studio, we have to do it like this. So this drum, you have to hit loud. This drum, you have to hit soft. This drum, you know, and he made him alter. Um, and JR was saying, you know, obviously he's a well-accomplished drummer and he was saying how difficult it was. And Bruce's comment was just, well, the good drummers can do it. <laughs> so, yeah. So he just expected these really high standards and it just, those little stories I found fascinating as to the, the lengths that he would go to, to get the sound to be the way that he wanted it to be, wrapping the microphones and placing them inside of instruments to get the sound that he wanted to yeah. get. And I think it comes back to what we were saying before, we've, we've 
seen Michael on stage and he's obviously able to convey all that emotion and that kind of thing when you're in his presence, I suppose. But if it wasn't for Bruce, some of that wouldn't have come across in the recordings. So it's almost as if Bruce was like the, chan the channel through which some of those messages come through. And as Bruce says, all those techniques kind of come together to, to portray music in that natural way, in that richness. And that's how we get the emotional quality that we see in all of his work. And I think as well, yeah, and I think, sorry, Angie, go on. I was just going to say, I think, I think um, what you're saying there and what a lot of I picked up on was the fact that like Michael, he's an innovator in his field. Like you said, the rapping and bubble wrap, the getting Michael to sing down a tube. And one thing I think he tries to get across to people, he's always of this, I have no secrets, there are no secrets, it's music first. He's, he's giving people the technical knowledge and that's in his book. But what he's trying to get across as well is that his ears were the most important and go with your ears, go with your gut and you know, do things, like you say, using like a, a puzzle and whatever, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily an expensive bit of an equipment. It was something he thought to do. Um, the bubble wrap and the tubes and whatever and all those elements and plywood for, you know, the drum to be on or Michael to stand on and, and record on. So I think it was that, that he was an innovator as well. I was just going to sort of add to that really. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's kind of where I was going. But I was, I was first of all going to say in, in, in terms of that kind of innovator quality that he had, it's like what we were saying before, those things um, were possible. And, and the reason that he was able to experiment with those things is because, you know, Michael very much gave him the green light to do that, as well as Quincy as well. And I just think that all of them, and I think maybe what we love as fans so much about the albums and maybe even on a subconscious level is how much kind of um innovative stuff and authentic material there is there is there you know we read in the book about um you know bruce used to record or send someone out to record really authentic sounds in and around la so he'd you know record like car door slamming and car door uh, cars you know beeping the horn and and you know chattering and and you know that's i think that's so unusual i mean i don't know too much about other sort of um songs and people's recording process but i think particularly in this day and age i think it's probably much more you know just kind of like find a beat and you know find a melody and i, I don't know i just i i don't know how much of that creative process really happens i i can't imagine it happens from the from the majority of artists and i don't think it probably ever really has and i i wonder how much um that makes michael's music stand out you know well i say to his fans to everyone i mean he's you know like the biggest selling artist of all times so, um you know i'm sure it's something that kind of everyone picked up on um moving away from the the microphones i really um enjoyed his section on where he talks about him enjoying the lights being low while he's working in in the studio and i know one of you um um touched upon this a second ago about the the instinct um but you know the book said that that he he often liked the lights to be low during recording and mixing as he believes that humans are primarily a visual animal so having low light allows us to rely more on our instincts and sense of hearing. And it's that idea about, you know, nothing is more powerful than, than your ears. And um, he says quite a few times about if you get goosebumps, that's, that's the sign that you're, you're looking for. You know, forget kind of what you're seeing or, um, you know, just, just go with your instincts. Let your, let your ears do the work. Look out for the goosebumps, that, that great feeling. And, and that kind of won't let you down. Um, and he always said that he referred back to his, he always referred back to his first, very first mixes of a song to return to his initial instinct. So it's again, that was, this was in, actually in a separate part of the book, but again, it's about that reliance on his, on his instinct. So even when he could have mixed something, you know, 90 times or whatever, like he did with Billy Jean, um, you know, he always, he said that, with all those mixes that he would do, he would always go back or regularly go back to his very first mixes to kind of get back 
that moment that it first influenced him. You know, that was the instinct. That's what he needed to go back to, um, to work on it further. So I found that really interesting too. Was there anything else um, about him in the studio that you guys wanted to discuss? Um, I, I mean, I just think he obviously mentions about his mum and dad, and I think we covered that in the beginning bit, but he said his mum was in a choir and, you know, his dad played instruments as well, and he seemed to pick up a lot from that. And because of their involvement with choirs and orchestras, I think that's his starting point was there, so he really understood the recording of instruments. So I think there's a, there's a lot of that that comes into it and he picks up. And one of the things he seems to talk about is, you know, letting the room, you're sort of recording the room. He says, you know, some people might microphone every instrument and he doesn't. And he mentions about um, the choir, which again, I thought back to obviously, you know, when his mum sang in a choir, the choir for Man in the Mirror, he's, you know, there were 60 vocalists. I only had two microphones. He obviously knew sort of he he knew what level on everything and he had a good ear with each artist he recorded what microphone is mean, he says about Michael you could put him on any microphone but with others he, he was very aware of which microphones and um he mentions there's certain technical names but it's people that sing where they're sort of the s's are, are more pronounced and you know you use other microphones on that so again it's just just a real had a real understanding and I think um, another thing that was said about him in might have been in the producer's room was about the fact that he could actually read music as well and he, he um, you know sort of thanked his, his mum and dad for forcing that so that's obviously something that isn't not every sort of you know recording person like himself actually does he, you know he mentioned that a lot of people nowadays they don't learn that art of reading music and again I think he said that was something that Quincy um, appreciated that he could actually do that so yeah um, I have a quote here by Peter Wade that I'd like to use to just wrap up the um, Bruce the technician um, section that we've been discussing um, and he says the legacy of Thriller lies not only in its unrivaled hit sales records legendary spawning of dance crazes music videos and modern sounds but also the very marked and definite bar it set for production and engineering excellence. It was Bruce's constant experimentation, focus and commitment that culminated in the benchmark thriller. And I think that really kind of just gels together everything that we've been saying about, you know, how he kind of worked in the studio and, and all of that sort of dedication and experimentation that, you know, he so enjoyed. Okay, so kind of linked, we're going to be now talking about Bruce, the King of Sound. So this is really focusing on Bruce as a pioneer um, and kind of continuing a little bit the, the conversation about him as an, an innovator in the field. Um, but we're going to be kind of going on a slightly different tangent. Um, I've got another quote here from Rod Templeton, um, which I think introduces this, this section nicely. He says, at the end of the day, when all of the complex recordings have been committed to tape and the final mix is done, Bruce always pulls out a pair of beaten up old speakers and listens one more time to ensure it sounds just as good for the millions of kids who don't have expensive audio gear. And I've slightly, I haven't paraphrased it, but I've slightly shortened that quote. Um, but again, I think that's so important because again, it's, it's considering um, you know how to reach that extended audience who is the most likely audience and obviously for Michael Jackson during the thriller period it, it probably was going to be um, that sort of audience and then it was making sure that what they were able to produce and hear in the studio was also going to be accessible um, you know for, for those people too so um, I really yeah I thought that was um, a really fantastic Quote. That that's uh, I sort of thought that was lovely. It was something I really remembered because it's I think it's quite at the beginning of the book, isn't it? Like yeah. you say, from Rod. But it, it really stuck with me when he said about these beaten up old speakers. He'd always bring them out, and I thought that that's I don't know. It's just lovely, and it just says a lot that he cares about what yes. everyone can hear. Um, that's so, yeah, really nice quote. There. Yeah, it's almost like well. 
you know, it's one thing for it to sound amazing for us here in the studio, but, um, you know, can we make it sound just as good for, for people who are not going to hear it in these kind of surroundings? Yeah. Um, Nicole, um, I know you had, um, you kind of discovered something particularly interesting in this section that I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about and introduce us to. Yeah. I, um, it was in a, one of the, the podcasts, in the Vinyl Nights podcast with um, J.R. Robinson. He first started talking about how he has um, a condition called synesthesia. And I don't think he mentions it in the book, but it is mentioned by another person um, yep. that he worked with who has the same condition. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know much about it, essentially it's um, a neurological condition where somebody who... Well, basically all of us we receive certain stimulus and our senses will respond accordingly so certain uh, obviously smells olfactory senses it, you know our body moves our kinesthetic senses are aware of that our vestibular senses are aware of that um, but someone with synesthesia basically a stimulus will will stimulate more than one sense at a time so the experience of a certain stimulus will be via two senses. So with Bruce, he actually could, I have to be careful not to say it wrong again, <laughs> but he would obviously hear music, but when he heard music, it made him see colors. Um, and there's different kinds of synesthesia. Um, some people, it just makes them see it in their mind. It seems that with Bruce, he, he literally saw colors. Um, and he gave the example of how um, certain lower sounds would be um, purple to him and the deeper the sound, the richer the purple to almost black. Um, and it just made me think to myself that um, having a condition like this, it makes you wonder if part of his genius, part of his amazing talents was because he actually experienced music through more than one sense. And I think all of us get a, a slight taste of that when we get goosebumps from music. Um, you know, essentially we're, we're getting a, a feeling on our body as opposed to just hearing it. But to imagine that hearing certain sounds would would trigger colours, it just is quite an amazing thing to think about. Um, and I just wanted to, to read a little section of the book. And it, I don't know who this person is, but it's one of um, the many um, younger engineers that Bruce um, mentored. And he talks about... Um, is it Arjun? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So he talks about um, closing your eyes and listening to like certain music. And he talks about um, hearing in colour, the reddish brown bass line of Billie Jean, the golden vocals in PYT, all the way across to the green slopes of the choir in Want to Be Starting Something, to the blue sky harmonies of The Girl Is Mine. Um, and this is another person who has that, that same condition. And it's just, I find it completely fascinating because it's obviously something I've not experienced, but to, you can almost get a sense of the colours when you hear somebody describe it that way. When you listen to the music, you think, oh, I can see sort of where they're coming from, but to actually experience it must be, you know, amazing. But it does make you wonder if that um, lent itself to Bruce being a bit more than others, if that makes sense. Yeah, it was really fascinating. I've I've actually never heard of that before, um, and to hear that you know Bruce had this condition as well as someone else in the book. I mean, I do wonder how common it actually is. And like you say, Nicole, whether this is a condition that is found more in you know musicians. people who are kind of involved in the creative arts. Yeah, like artists or musicians. Um, yeah, it would be really interesting. I'm sure there's probably been studies done on this. It, it might be interesting to delve into that a little bit more. But um, it was really fascinating. And I've got no doubt that that probably contributed to his ability to um, to well, literally and metaphorically see things um, in a different way or have a certain vision that maybe um, people who don't have that condition would never sort of even dream of, of being able to to create really so yeah it was really fascinating um Angela did you want to add anything no I was just gonna say on that I mean Nicole I know you raised it more because although he kind of said it 
because he didn't talk about it as in, oh, I have this thing. I hadn't quite picked up on it as much as to when you brought it up. And um, I think maybe to him it was just normal. Maybe he thinks everybody was sort of like, has that ability. But it was interesting and I find it interesting because you obviously had a little bit more of an understanding and looked into it more. Of when you you said about it and that realizing I mean it's a bit like you know my I've got a daughter who's dyslexic and they their brains work differently and creative and just you know sit, realizing that it wasn't just something metaphorically was talking about it was actually something that he you know did witness and that's how he saw it and I'm sure that did add to his genius because if you've got an extra sense that the rest yeah. of us don't have yeah I mean going to fine-tune you even more to your craft so yeah really interesting and he does he does say in that podcast that um in order for the um uh, it had this the colors had to be right in order for the sound to be right so he obviously did use both of the senses to get um his sound the way that he wanted his sound to be yeah fascinating <laughs> it, excuse me it's really interesting and um Another quote that I like directly from Bruce, which kind of links to that and what we were saying before about why he liked working in sort of low light in the studios. He says, in order to trigger an emotional response in the soul of the listener, music must be close to the primitive. It must make you feel with your feet rather than think with your head. That last bit I paraphrase. But, um, you know, I think that maybe experiencing music with that synesthesia, it really helped him to be able to do that. and um it kind of made him realize the importance not realize that's that's silly obviously he realized it but um it made him even more in tune i guess with his own senses and, and the senses that other people might have and might use to kind of listen to the music so yeah i thought that was a really nice quote too um, okay, we're going to have a short break. Um, when we come back, we're going to be talking more about um, Bruce's work and relationship with Michael, um, which obviously we thoroughly and particularly enjoyed uh, reading and, and researching about. Um, so we're going to have a break for about 10 minutes um, and then we'll, we'll be back to, to discuss those points. So I'm going to leave you with this beautiful picture of Bruce and B, and uh, we'll shut off for 10 minutes and we'll see you very soon.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed the first half. So um, the first half was very much focusing on, you know, Bruce as a person and kind of getting a little bit more in tune with um, his kind of work process and, and how he created this fantastic music that we, that we all love listening to. This second half is going to be focusing much more on his work with Michael. So we're going to be discussing um, Michael's albums uh, one by one and, and talking about the, the input that Bruce had into those albums and kind of any anecdotes or stories that Bruce um, relayed to us about those albums in the book. And then we're going to be um, talking about Bruce on, on Michael as a person. You know, he speaks a lot about in the book, Michael as a person and, and not just as, as an artist, but how Bruce found Michael to, to be around really and, and um, the, the, the relationship that he built up with him. And then for the last discussion point, we're going to be um, finishing by talking about Bruce's legacy and what we feel um, from his book and his work that he has left behind. So um, one of the things that, I suppose the first thing that we kind of have to address is, is how Bruce came into Michael's life. Um, and of course that was through Quincy Jones. Um, and Jeanette um, Simpson pointed out something really interesting um, in the, that came actually from the foreword in the book that Quincy wrote, which is that Bruce met Quincy in 1958 um, which of course was the year Michael was born, and that they met in Chicago, which of course <laughs> is um, not too far from Gary, Indiana. So um, again, we, she felt, and I, I think when she uh, made the rest of us realize how their relationship kind of started, it again, it feels something that's very serendipitous, if you like. You know, the fact that, that the two biggest um, influences I guess on on Michael's career um, met the year he was born in the state that he was born um, does feel very very odd um, but Bruce actually met Michael on the set of The Wiz um, which we all love um, but of course he he first started working with Michael um, sort of musically in terms of his albums of course Off the Wall was was the first album that they worked on together. Um, Bruce said that Michael was very keen to shed his child star, star image with this album. Um, and it was kind of seen very much even at the time as Michael's coming of age album. So that was kind of at the, at the forefront of all of their minds when, when creating this album. Um, quite a lot of really fascinating little insights into this album I found. Um, quite a big section on She's Out of My Life. Uh, something um, that I found quite interesting written about don't stop to you getting us there's there's some nice and this is this is the, the parts that I really liked particularly about the book because um, Betty Lou wrote in to say that she really felt like she was able to be a fly on the wall in the studio you know when she's reading these um, little anecdotes from Bruce about working with Michael and it's very much how I felt how I, um, when I went to um, Brad Sundberg's um, seminar, you do feel like you were there and you're finding out all of these little bits and pieces, almost like little secrets of, of them working together, which is uh, so fascinating to me. Um, so who'd like to start with this one off the wall? We're, so we're gonna go through this album by album and kind of share any, any nice little anecdotes or, or stories mm -hmm. that we discovered through the book. Can I, can I take a, a second to um, go back to The Wiz for a moment? Please do, yeah, was, please do. There was a story from The Wiz that I found completely fascinating. Um, Bruce talking about um, not only how he um, used some of his recording techniques and had to modify them for motion picture, but in particular the story of him kind of decking out a truck, a sound truck yeah. that was then used for the dancers. Cause obviously the dancers hearing the music is essential. And I, I just love the story of the big Emerald city scene um, and how it was really challenging from a sound perspective because the dancers were so spread out. So he actually built um, a speaker trough essentially in the middle so that no one dancer was ever more than 15 feet away from the speakers at any yeah. point in time. And just, I just thought, I mean, that's not even his area of expertise was, was the 
making a movie. He was he was a recording engineer, but here he was just kind of rolling with it and coming up with these innovations, I suppose, to to make it work sound wise. I just you know obviously it goes back to his his genius as a technician um, and having that foresight and that innovation as well. Yeah, and on that, Nicole, he said, if you if you look at the movie, you can just see that I went back to it, and oh, you can you? just you can just see the trough. So it's really yeah. interesting because I, I mean, yeah, I'm sure in my visual field, I obviously saw that, but I wouldn't have noticed it at all, knowing, knowing what it was. And it wasn't until I read that and I went back and I was like, oh yeah, you can see that trough of what he's talking about and recording. So it was interesting. Yeah. I loved the story in the book linked to that where he said um, that a couple of drunks, you know, it was like freezing, it was like November time, so they climbed onto the truck and then they started banging on the, the bottom of the truck telling them to keep the noise down, you know, and uh, he said like only in New York or something like that, but yeah, there was no, there were, you're right to, to bring it back, there were some great stories from the Wiz and I think with the, um, that thing about never being 15 feet away from, from the speakers, I found that, or from the dancers, sorry, I found that really fascinating. I think it was all about making sure that the, the, the action and the, the music were all in sync, because obviously if you're playing music back, um, I think I've got this right way around, I think he said that sight, um, sight it travels quicker than sound, is that the right way around? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, to, even that, just the amount of, um, <laughs> things that had to be considered and thought about to make sure everything was perfect. It was, yeah, it was a really interesting um, little part of the book. Yeah, and Emma, where you said about off the wall and um, I, you obviously said about she's out of my life. I think one bit that I highlighted, we probably all did, is where he's talking about that. And he says, um, how Michael could do such a sincere interpretation of the lyric has always puzzled me. But because I know it was an experience he never had even thought about. When we were recording Michael's vocal, vocals, he broke down and cried at the end of every take. We recorded about six or seven takes. At the end of each, Michael would be sobbing, actually crying. I know he was sincere because when we finished that last take, Michael was too embarrassed to come in the control room. And he just tippy-toed out the back door of the studio, got in his car and left the studio building. Um, and again, he sort of said, um, he'd never had that kind of grown-up relationship with anybody I don't think so anyway and the one thing that made me think about is that um I know Bruce is thinking oh he hasn't had anything like that but I even thought about you know that love that he always held for Diana Ross as a young boy and obviously she was older I do sort of wonder if it's those kind of elements that made him feel like that because she was never quite in his reach in that regard he obviously had a lot of adoration for her so could he still feel it where it not might not be the way sort of Bruce is thinking where you've had a relationship that then has ended but it's that kind of lost love because he never quite got it that that was what it made me think about um when when he was saying that I don't know if you you thought or whether there was a anything you thought that maybe gave Michael that I've yeah. heard before there's a lot of speculation about whether that emotion that he felt was about um, Diana Ross. I think there, there's some people that um, claim it might have been written about Diana Ross, but I don't believe Michael wrote that, if I'm not mistaken. So I think, you know, people are talking more about the emotion that, that is coming out. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I think Bruce is obviously saying. He's, he's wondering how he can bring in that emotion. I mean, we know anyway, when he's in the Jackson 5, he could sing, sing about things that he clearly had an experience and people have always said he was like an old soul. So it could just be that. But um, And it wasn't actually me even thinking that anybody had said about Diana Ross. It's just when I was reading that, that's what came to my mind, thinking, oh, I wonder if it's actually that connection you can make from something you, you haven't quite been able to get. And the other thing that was obviously um, quite funny, it was that it's on page 21 as well, where he's saying about... Um, Michael not being able to say the word damned in decision and cursed pride he didn't like using that word and we know later in life in some of Michael's lyrics he can say a few words that are worse but obviously this is early on in his career um, and he's still obviously very polite well he was always polite but you know he's still got that worry about um, using those kind of words and I think to us nowadays damned in, you know it's it's not really anything but it was obviously a big deal to him so that was quite sweet. 
yeah and i loved the um you know um he said quincy sort of said to him i think quincy probably got a little bit frustrated because michael just refused to say it. and in the end he's like listen you've got to say it and michael's like yeah i know <laughs> And he did eventually do it, but it was just such an issue for him having to say that word. Yeah, exactly. Nicole, sorry, I cut you off earlier. Oh, I can't remember what I was going to say oh. earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I found fascinating, and um, I I didn't know that it was bottle percussion they were doing on yeah. Don't do you get enough i mean i i could i can hear the sound but um i must admit i do concentrate on vocals when i listen because it's michael's voice that i love so much and i know that those other sounds are there but i did find it fascinating to listen to bruce talking about the bottle percussion and i did go back and listen to that song and went, oh there it is i can hear yeah. it um and him talking about how and how and why he used the ribbon mics for that particular thing and why that worked well and all of those elements again goes back to his um his um qualities as a technician I, I suppose but it was just interesting to get that insight into um into the album that you know we've listened to over and over again and songs that we've heard so many times before and kind of now hearing a new element that's that's really interesting and the fact that Michael and his brothers played that percussion as well I really I quite like when I hear sort of some of the things that Michael did in the background and when he gets his um you know, brothers and sisters involved. I thought that was really cool. I didn't know that either. And then also Bruce talks about how even um, having to, um, you know, like you said, set up things in a different way so that the, the sound, that clarity that you said earlier would, would still be there. Because I think sometimes, well, quite often there's a risk with percussion because you're hitting something. You've got that kind of risk for like echo and all kinds of stuff going on. Um, so yeah, just every little thing had to be had to be thought about. Um, something else I found interesting from the book with regards to Off the Wall was this picture here. Mm. And it says, was, it says as the I caption. Ask you, worked out who it was. <laughs> well, it says with Off the Wall, we really started collecting awards, and who Clara and Clarence are, we leave to the reader to find out. So obviously, that's like super intriguing. So I did do a little bit of research and um, I mean, there might be probably fans who are shouting at the screen saying, well, it's obviously this person. The only person that I can think that it might be is someone actually who we've recently discussed on the, um, on the book club um, page. And that's um, Clarence, I, I think his last name is pronounced Avant, A-V-A-N-T. And um, someone's mentioned about the Netflix documentary, The Black Godfather. Mm, and I, I just wondered if it was him. I can't find out who Clara is. Um, yeah, I, I'd watched that documentary, but I actually thought it was just maybe nicknames for Bruce and B. Ah, That's maybe. what I thought. Clara, Clara and Clarence, Bruce and B, you know, I know different letters, but that, that was my thing. I kind of just thought, oh, it is actually them. Some kind of nickname. Well, if anyone know, knows, let us know. know. <laughs> yeah we'll have to but you're right about that with the, with that documentary I did watch that but I, yeah I didn't I thought it was more I read that more as nicknames rather than actual people's names but I was hoping we would find out somewhere and I thought have I missed it because I certainly didn't find the answer to it I haven't I haven't been able to find it anywhere and then when the only Clarence that did come up was was him who is so highly thought of in in music and in black music and especially around that sort of time i thought okay well that fits really well but it probably isn't even him anyway anyway if you do know let us let us know yeah um okay this is the big one thriller um <clears throat> we discussed this actually quite a lot last month obviously we've we, We've, our focus last month was on the genesis of Thriller by Damien Shields and, and so there, there was a lot that was said about Thriller um, but yet still probably out of all of my notes the most notes that I have again is on the Thriller album I mean I just feel like there's just constantly so much to talk about with this album and there were some really really great um, again stories and anecdotes and, and techniques that we found out about in the recording of, of this album um, so 
let's kind of go right back to the beginning. So it said in the book that the first session for with the recording of Thriller was at 12 noon on Wednesday, April 14th, 1982 at Westlake Audio Studio A. That first session was Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney recording The Girl Is Mine. And I found it funny, um, the story about Michael keeps singing The Girl Is Mine's. <laughs> So he kept putting this S on the end, which obviously is, is a very colloquial thing um, to say. Um, and I think Bruce attributed it in a, in a podcast to Joe and just said, you know, that Joe kind of taught them um, sort of bad ways of speaking. Um, and Q was getting, in quotes, pissed. Um, that was from Corey Cambridge's podcast, Silent Giants, which actually I really enjoyed that podcast. So I'd, I'd suggest listening to that um, interview with Bruce. Um, but he kept singing it and Q kept kind of telling him and, and he just kept saying the girl is mine and Q was saying Michael it's mine and Michael was saying but that's what I'm saying and he said no you're not you're saying mine and eventually I think well he obviously did sort it out but I really loved that that little kind of introductory story to Thriller. Um, any kind of little anecdotes or stories or techniques that you guys found particularly interesting about this album? Uh, I quite liked, um, I heard this in a, a couple of different places, but just in talking about how they got started with Thriller and he obviously, um, and this was on the podcast from last month as well, the, this idea of everybody coming together at the beginning to, you know, make the best quality music anyone's ever heard, you know, almost with the ambition of saving the recording, um, the recording industry. And I like um, Bruce's phrase that he used in a couple of places um, and he's talking about how you can't just throw money at it because creativity and money don't speak the same or don't talk to each other I think was the line that he used I find I found that quite fascinating just that um, well not fascinating so much as in, in interesting that um, you know it wasn't about money and acknowledging that it was hard work and talent and all of the things that that went into it I like the way that he sort of set that up um, and one of the um, stories or what, one of the parts of, of Thriller that I, um, I almost found a little bit sad was um, Bruce talking about a particular article that was written about him and it was titled The Invisible Man um, and I, I think it might have been about Rod Temperton as well but he yeah. says um, he never saw himself that way he never saw himself as the invisible man behind Michael Jackson's work and then he said oh perhaps perhaps we are uh, and I thought, oh, that's a little bit sad. Um, but at the same time, I sort of thought, well, I think um, the vast majority of MJ fans certainly know who Bruce is. And um, hopefully the, the book club will know a little bit more about him after watching after watching this. But um, certainly if you don't know who he is, I suppose he is an invisible man, but def certainly he shouldn't be seen that way. And perhaps he, was, he never felt that way because of the way Michael and Quincy were that, you know, he was certainly part of part of it all um, a huge part of it all really yeah and when you just said about the the creativity and money and i've actually got that one highlighted as well i think that's what he mentions about appreciating in quincy and michael that they felt the same it wasn't about budgets and again a bit when i was sort of alluding earlier that i think sometimes it, it speaks volumes in what he doesn't say there's very brief things where it kind of says about executives like music executives and he clearly doesn't think too highly of most of those kind of people that because he's you know you can then work see that he sees that they're more about the business of it they're more about the money the budgets and him Quincy and Michael had in common that they were about the music and getting the most from that so yeah I think that sort of comes across in many many of those podcasts and documentaries um, and certainly I think what came across in all of them is Thriller is his favourite piece of work. He, Thriller, the song as well, he said was his favourite. Um, if you close your eyes, it's a bit as you were speaking um, earlier with, if you close your eyes, you can actually visualise the song because you obviously there's all those sounds in it. Um, and that was, that was his obviously favourite, but he's, you can tell his pride in this piece of work. You know, he obviously loves all the other albums and continuing to work with Michael and other artists, but he's clearly knows that they really got it with with Thriller and he thoroughly 
enjoys it and was really, really very proud of this work. Yeah, yeah that certainly does shine through. Um, some of the little things he says in some of the podcasts I listen to, which are, are quite recent podcasts from sort of the last few years. Um, and in one, uh, in one of them, he was talking about Thriller and saying how, you know, even all these years later, it's the one that I get asked about the most. Um, and then he said, so it must sound all right. <laughs> so I found that quite funny, that kind of throwaway comment, but obviously he was being quite sarcastic because at the same time, it does really shine through just how much he loved working on Thriller and how proud he is of his work on that album. Yeah, I really loved a particular quote. I can't remember if this was from the book um, or whether it was from one of the podcasts I listened to, but um, Bruce said, we all had so much fun recording Thriller. We would still be recording now if we could. And it was just that idea that, you know, again, kind of going back to what we were saying before, it, it wasn't a job for them, particularly that album, but probably all of them. Mm -hmm. It was a passion that they all shared. And, um, you know, I, I can believe that they thoroughly enjoyed the, the creative process that, that they took to, to create those albums. Mm. I found um, it quite interesting too to hear that there was all these people, people had had a sense of something big was happening and there were all lots of people coming to sort of watch and view. And of course the funny story of the lady flashing them at the front of the studio was quite hilarious. <laughs> Oh dear. Is that the one that just lifts her dress right the way up and she's not wearing, yeah. Very true. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, there was a story about Fleetwood Mac coming in, wasn't there? Because obviously you've got so many musicians sort of in, the, in those studios. There's all different studios there. And um, they sort of came in and said, oh, you know, we, we heard that you're creating something big here. And so they, they were sort of playing it for them. And, uh, you know, they were loving it and they were dancing around and stuff. And I really loved, and I just think this so um, epitomises Michael, really. Bruce said that Michael was hiding in the, um, oh, what's it called? The control room. Yes, he was hiding in the control room with Bruce, but he was just so elated that people were reacting to this album the way that they were. And not just anybody, you know, high-end kind of musicians um you know felt that he was doing a fantastic job with his work so i really liked that there was um in, in terms of songs there was some um particularly really interesting points about billy jean that that was raised um in the book um obviously bruce says that billy jean was the most personal song michael ever wrote and he went on to tell the story that apparently came from michael that the um the influence for that song um, came from a woman who climbed over the house of his wall, sorry, the wall of his house, <laughs> um, and was laying by the swimming pool in a bathing suit, and then later accused Michael of fathering one of her twins. So I'm not quite sure <laughs> biologically how that would happen. Um, but what I really found fascinating about Billie Jean was learning about the little things that they were doing that made the sound different you know we keep hearing about thriller sounded so different for its time and i know for me um i sort of just missed out on on hearing that at the time i was i was born a few years later um than when thriller was released so you know i've always listened to that album for in a much more modern era where you know stuff like that isn't necessarily so out of the norm but you know what you do hear from a lot of people who talk about thriller is how how innovative it was for that time and how different it was for that time. Um, and one of the things that I found really interesting about Billie Jean was um, the use of this really unusual instrument, which is called a lyricon. Um, and it's, it's weird, like I've, I've listened to a couple of YouTube um, clips of, of people playing it and it's really weird. It's kind of like loads of different instruments in one. Um, obviously it's a wind instrument, but when you blow it, it, it sounds kind of part cello, part trumpet, part flute, part clarinet. It's, um, it's really interesting. Obviously, when you listen to Billie Jean, you, you, you can hear it in the background. But, you know, something like that, you know, Quincy said, I, I want to get this really unusual instrument into Billie Jean and just constantly, it was just constantly about how can we make 
the sound unique? How can we bring something that people have never heard before and just in every element? And then obviously in one of the documentaries that I watched about um, Bruce, he showed um, how he used this drum cover um, for Billie Jean. And that's why the, the Billie, you know, as soon as Billie Jean starts, it's such a, it's such a unique sound and it's just a, a drum beat, but it's, it's so distinctive and it's because he covered the um, kind of base of the drum, sorry, I don't know what it's called, with this cover. And then he put the microphone inside the cover, zipped it up so that the sound was, was captured within this cover and it kind of couldn't escape. Um, so yeah, just, I really, really enjoyed reading all these kind of um, little techniques that, that they used. And, you know, I think those, well, that, this one alone with, with the drum cover, um, I think that probably did make a huge difference into how popular Billie Jean was. I mean, even now you go to you go to any party or you're in a nightclub, or whatever. If Billie Jean comes on, that that start that beat is so distinctive, and straight away it just you know it's just such a it's such a popular sound. And to think that it was all kind of created with this, and it's those little touches that really did make music's Michael very very different. I think that's one of the things he says somewhere, isn't it? I don't know if it's just about that song or generally about Michael's, is that you can tell the songs that they are almost straight away from those first few seconds of intros. And I think it is things like those instruments, like you say. And the one that you showed before, I can't remember its name, but I, I'd i never heard of it. So I looked it up as well. And it, it was just interesting even learning that. So I think this book is... you. If you are one of these people who's inquisitive, it's quite good because you can read about something and then learn a little bit more. Um, it's certainly been something I've never heard of. So even though obviously I've been hearing it sound for all these years, but to actually know that instrument is, uh, is good. I've got, um, there's, there's a quote here as well where he's talking about um, Thriller in here, which I just thought was nice. He was saying, Something else happened with Thriller that I find very interesting. Up, at, up until the tremendous success of Thriller, I would hear my white friends say, Ray Charles is okay, but Elvis is the guy, you know. Or Stevie Wonder is cool, but check out Billy Joel. Well, they can't say that anymore. I am intensely proud of being part of the making of Michael Jackson's Thriller, the biggest album in the history of recorded music. And I think that well, we were saying earlier about his pride in it. I think that kind of quote says it all. He, he thinks... He certainly believes that, you know, that that album and Michael, that was it. It topped everything. Um, and, and not just record sales showing that. I think he feels it and, and all of those things. And it, it sort of, he feels it showed the, the wider world how talented Michael was. Yeah. One of my favorite, talking about some of the technical sides of things and the, the drum cover, I was fascinated with that, but also the cardboard tube that he talks about that he recorded mm -hmm. Michael's or part of the vocals. I've always listened to, you know, that there's variation in how the vocals sound throughout the songs and that particular line, the don't think twice that he sang through that cardboard tube. Now that I hear the story of it, I go, ah, oh, like it kind of, I know I'm not an expert, but it kind of makes sense because he somehow sounds further away but louder and it just, you know, to think of, oh, let's just try singing it through here and see what that does. But obviously he had a good ear for things and good instincts, but those having those little insights into the album is just, is it's, it's really, really cool. I think that's why when we were saying earlier, I think it's interesting to read the book and then have your headphones in as much as Bruce hates headphones. <laughs> he makes that very clear and he's very, very sensitive about his ears and uh, he's, he's obviously, he's, he's tall. But um, yeah, for me, listening with headphones, when I get into a certain bit of the book, going to that song and listening to those bits, you know, we've all heard these songs. I think we know them inside and out, but you do then suddenly hear something slightly different or you have an appreciation but for something you maybe didn't pick up on quite so much. Talking of earphones, um, it made me laugh when he said, when he talked about the first time Vincent Price listened to Thriller through earphones, and it said that he jumped up from his stall with a very startled look on his face, and Bruce said, I knew that he'd never heard anything like that before. So, um, yeah, you could just imagine that as well. <laughs> 
Okay, what about the Victory um, album? So there was sort of not, obviously not as much said about this, but, um, you know, a couple of interesting facts. I mean, I suppose things that we um, sort of generally knew before, but Victory became the biggest seller and highest charting album of the Jackson's career and the only album where all six brothers featured. State of Shock, which of course was the one that, um, that Bruce uh, recorded, was the biggest hit from the album. So again, I think that kind of says a lot as well. Um, interestingly, he mentions um, a song that I hadn't heard before called Be Not Always. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have listened to it, um, but I did find it interesting that he said that Bruce felt it had a bit of a message for Michael's fans. And I know that we discussed this a little bit and I think maybe I was going off one way and, um, you know, you guys were, were thinking, coming sort of at it from a different angle. But have you guys listened to that song? What do you think I, of it? I've known that song since obviously I got into Michael. Uh, I, I started off by buying all the Jacksons and Jackson 5 final so I've known that I've always loved that song it's a beautiful um vocal of his of Michael's it's just very very pure um and it, I always find it is one of those goosebump songs for me I do find that a very moving song um but it was interesting yeah he said a message for for Michael's fans and I still not sure I'm completely clear on exactly it, but I do. I, I just think it's an absolutely beautiful song, and I always have. It's one of my. It's one of my favourite Jackson songs. Nicole, what about you? If you are you really familiar with that song? No, I'm not really familiar with it at all. I've only came to know it in the last little while. Um, but my interpretation of the lyrics is is that it's along the line of the messages that he was trying to give with. Um, heal the world, Earth song, you know, the, he trying to tell us to sort of let's let's not always be like this, and kind of trying to evoke change more than anything. That's how I interpreted the lyrics of that one. But it is the vocal on it is goosebump worthy, I think. Mm. We'll have to post the link for that because um, I'm assuming. Well, particularly for sort of younger fans, they, they might also not be very familiar with that one. Okay, bad. Um, oh, there was actually quite a lot for this album that I found really um, fascinating. I mean, Bruce mentions that uh, one of his all time favorites of music done with Michael is Liberian Girl. Um, he said, you know, he, he just seemed to be really in awe of Michael with that song um, and just kind of said, you know, who else could create something like that other than, than Michael? And he loved the fact that it it gave, he, Bruce seemed to like, you know, it's the same with, with Thriller. Thriller with, was his favorite song from the album. And he seems to really like songs that create um, a visual as much as a, an audio experience. And um, he said that, you know, Liberian Girl did that for him. He, he actually calls it an amazing musical and sonic fantasy. Um, he did, the, the quote was a little bit longer than that, but he did also talk about kind of the, the visual um, stimulus that it, it kind of encouraged as well. Um, I was also really surprised to hear, as apparently lots of other people are, which is why he mentions it, that there was no effect used for the choir in Man in the Mirror, uh, sorry, Man in the Mirror. I thought that was really fascinating because that, ending to that song is so climactic and it's so loud and it's so it's just so beautiful and you would think that there definitely would you know out of all of the songs you, you would have thought that that definitely would have had some some sort of sound engineering work done on it to make it have that quality of, of sound um, he did say obviously there was um, some sort of simple microphone so a microphone technique used but there was no kind of tricks, no um, no effect, and um, I thought that was that was really amazing as well. And that was the one I mentioned earlier, where he said it was literally two microphones to those sixteen yeah. singing voices. That's right. Choir. So amazing. Quite... Um, interestingly, Bruce says I have more favourite songs on this album than any other of the MJ albums. 
Uh, many people have told me that the sound on the Bad album is the best of all Michael Jackson albums. I don't know about that. But um, yeah, this seems to be a popular one with, with Bruce. So uh, what did you guys kind of find out new from, from the book about this album? One that the working title of it was P. <laughs> The PWE, but that was a Quincy sort of name for it. And it seems, again, I think what we've, we hear through all these documentaries and everything is that there was a lot of nicknames for people and songs. And, you know, my, Michael's nickname was Smelly and um, Bruce's was oh, uh, Sphinx and, and that. But yeah, the working title that it was given as a nickname was P. <laughs> Chelsea. Not, as we as we know, P not not so nice. But then there's the story about um, basically it's supposed to be a, a song for Prince and Michael, and then Prince didn't really want to do it, but he knew it was going to be a hit, and he kind of you know walks off saying it's going to be a hit even without me. So mm -hmm. Nicole, I I quite liked the story that he includes about the bad tour. Um, that they were in Japan um, and arrived to an airport that was only supposed to have just, well, there was 1500 press that were there, but there was nobody else there, but it still went crazy. And that sort of Michael and like Bruce and B and all the others that were with them had to sort of circle around Michael and try and protect him from the crowd. Um, and Bruce couldn't get over the rudeness of, of the people and, <laughs> and that experience, but it just, you know, obviously, Michael had to deal with that his whole life, but Bruce kind of got that small taste on the on the bad tour with what he goes through all the time. So that was um, a, a little anecdote that I enjoyed reading about. Yeah, he says there's like 1,500 of the media on little wooden ladders and things. So yeah, yeah. and I think it's also the bad tours the first time he sees him live, isn't it, in concert in Japan. Um, yeah. that's when he says him and B didn't recognize him because the person he was on stage was not the person he was in the recording studio. So it's interesting, obviously seeing his insight that, you know, we, we know that about Michael and he also always said it himself. It's almost like two personas. It's a shy character and then the stage persona, but Bruce obviously very much saw that, um, for his own, with his own eyes and, and knowing Michael. I also like the uh, the story of Speed Demon and how yeah. Bruce is <laughs> getting a speeding ticket on the way. The only time he was ever late to the recording studio because he got a speeding ticket. <laughs> and it was the day that they were going to record Speed Demon. So that's quite a funny story, really. Yeah, it's a good one. I enjoyed that. And I was really, um, I was really interested to learn as well that my, uh, Michael did part of the percussion on bad with his mouth and mm. um i think bruce calls it the um how now brown cow right so yeah. i went back to the song the I, I listened to the instrumental version and i think i've managed to work out have you guys listened out for it too no i haven't yet i think i i think i can pick it out because the fact that he calls it how now brown cow obviously anyone who's um, really familiar with the English language will know that that is kind of used um, for like elocution therapy. Yeah, or elocution lessons te um, teaching how to, to enunciate properly. And um, so I guess it's going to have that kind of owl sound. And when you listen to the instrumental version, there is a clear, it's not throughout the whole song. Um, I think it might be on the verse or the bridge. But you do hear that, and I do wonder if that's um, if that's what it is. But that that's all the kind of little stuff that I really like finding out about, just those little kind of secret details that you wouldn't know unless somebody told you. Mm. Yeah, he says Ma Michael is a master at beatbox math percussion. I think we know that from when you hear all those outtakes of him beatboxing in demos and that, you know, the talent there to be able to do all of that as well. Obviously, blue. Okay, what about the Dangerous album? This is where they talk about the Slam Dunk Sisters, isn't it? And the Family Night Friday started during the, the Dangerous era. Yeah, I've, it looks, 
sort of still is in me. He says it started with a wonderful tradition during bad. Oh, okay. Yeah, every Friday about 5 p.m., Michael's cooks from the ranch, Catherine Bellard and Laura Rayner would come to the studio and cook an absolutely delicious evening meal for the entire studio crew. Eventually it became family night. So, and you know, family members and crew and all their pets could come along and it was a happy event. It's just, that's a really nice tale. I just see it. See it that. Um, Dangerous album, he's saying that's where Michael B and him moved into the Hilton Universal Hotel. Yes. And it's, it, there's the funny story about Michael forgetting his key. Yes. Well, I think it's while they're at that same hotel, isn't it? Yeah, um, right. If I can find that, because that, that was a good one. But it's on page 49 and he said um, that basically they, they had to call up and ask because his, his room was registered in the name of Mr. Sherman um, and it was three o'clock in the morning so they called the front desk and then he suggested that perhaps they could send up a cot for Michael to sleep in their room which is quite funny and uh, yeah so it, he seems like he was hit with hit, him and uh, B for quite a lot of a night yeah it just seems like, I think, again, it's another nice thing learning about Bruce, you know, the, he, the good people he did have around him. Because obviously we know he had so many of the wrong type. It is nice and you can imagine, yeah. um, you know, as we've said, the relationship that him and B had, that'd be a lovely thing for, for Michael to, to be around. And like that, they can joke and laugh and, you know, also look after him, really. Um, I think one of those, I don't know whether it's, related to but it's on that page whether it is the dangerous one but there's the sort of the shower cubicle in the studios and it's just about doing recording some vocals inside there as well and again that shows his sort of innovation isn't it of thinking well do you know what use that area for vocal recording i know i'm not sure if it was bad or, or yeah dangerous. it was it i'm was, oh, sorry if you're talking about yeah that was bad the hand claps yeah, he records the hand claps in the shower because it, that was the best place to do it, a nice small room. But, yeah, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Sorry, yeah, it does. It's just during the recording of Bad. So that's, uh, My yeah. favourite part of the um, Dangerous section was about Jam um, mm -hmm. and how the idea for Jam actually was, was Bruce. Um, and it was him and somebody called, is it Rennie Moore or Renee Moore? I'm not sure who yeah. that is. Renee um, Moore. Where they were working together, essentially layering vintage drum performances with contemporary sounds. And after they were just playing around with it, and after they had um, sort of put something together, they decided that they needed to show Michael, and he loved it so much that it eventually became Jam. So I found that quite fascinating that it, um, you know, you just, I make the assumption and I know I'm making assumptions, but if it's a Michael Jackson song written by Michael Jackson, even when there's other names there, I often just assume that it's probably more him than it is anyone else. But it's just interesting to find out that it actually started from just an, an idea of making sound in a certain percussion. Uh, and that's where, where the song Jam came from. That's really interesting to me. Yeah. And that, that's where you can see where um, Bruce actually has his name against Jam. And I think at the end of the yeah. book, was it was wasn't it up for an award for him for not just the mixing but I think it's actually something with regards to um, the writings. It says music by Renee Moore, Bruce Swedy, and um, Michael Jackson and Teddy Riley, and I think he gets he gets some more credit on it for that. Yeah, so. it was um, best engineered recording category. Oh, it's still, was it? I thought it was something else, but yeah. Oh no, there is another. Um, I, I don't know, I think it's an acronym, ASCAP Awards. Yeah. That one, Top 10 Writer. So, yeah, Bruce was awarded the Top 10 Writer for Jam, and it says Artist Michael Jackson. And another one, actually, Top 10 Publisher, Bruce Redeem, for the same song, Artist Michael Jackson. Yeah. So, yeah, no, you're right. He was, yeah. And, and it's got him down as well. He's, he's on the drums, him and Teddy Riley. So, obviously, with what you're saying about them practicing, he's down, you know, named as one of the drummers on that album, uh, on that song as well. Okay, what about <laughs> history? Uh, what stands out with history is this. Um, recording of Smile and Childhood yeah. uh, with, with the live orchestras and I just loved reading the story of how um, they used a large studio uh, and where Bruce 
said he would normally use a concert hall or something similar when recording it, an orchestra, um, but how he sort of made adjustments for that. But then um, the story of them recording, so Michael sang live with the orchestra, which is, um, again, a fascinating thing to, to imagine being in that room listening to that. But that afterwards, Michael wanted to come out and meet the all the musicians and they gave him a standing ovation when he came out because they were listening to his performance through their through their headphones. So that was um yeah, that was quite a striking moment in the book and obviously would have been in the in the making of history as well. Yeah. I I think that story is really sweet because again it's it's like Michael being very humble, isn't it? He almost asked the permission to come out and meet them. Yeah. Rather assuming that everybody would want to meet him anyway um yeah yeah i think that's lovely and i think your the deca tree which uh, microphones um i think you might have a picture of that that comes into a lot in that isn't it it's where he was he talks about using the deca tree um system and he's got um various photos of you know how how things are set up so that's really good. And again, with you saying childhood and smile, they were the two that I mentioned before that Bruce certainly quotes as basically saying, you know, anybody, you know, I challenge anyone to sort of listen to those songs with their eyes closed and um, I'll give you 10 bucks if you don't end up crying. I think um, in contrast to, to what we were saying about um, sort of that experience that Michael had when, when he walked out to that orchestra and, and the 50 um, musicians kind of gave him a standing ovation and, and how, um, you know, delighted he felt about that. Um, I felt it was just an absolutely dreadful story that Bruce told where um, he talks about the playback session to the recording company. And he, he already said like, Michael hates doing those anyway. Um, but then for the playback for history, which is essentially where they play the, the entire album to the recording company, um, the last note sounded and everyone from the record label got up and just left the studio without saying a word. And Michael was devastated and said to Bruce, I'll never do this again. And I think like when you think about his feelings and his reactions to, you know, that orchestra um, story and when, you know, Fleetwood Mac came in, to listen to Thriller and how overjoyed they were to hear his music and then how overjoyed that made him feel. Um, you know, and, and obviously we've discussed a lot this evening about how much effort Bruce, Michael and Quincy put into these albums. Um, Quincy, obviously not, not history, but, um, you know, that would have deeply, and I don't think anything could have probably hurt Michael more than someone listening to an album that he's put his heart and soul into and put so much hard work and effort and dedication and and for them to just walk out without saying anything um i don't think you could probably do something to hurt michael more and i think that's when you start having to really question start questioning the agendas of the record companies from that time i agree because i don't think as any sort of member of even the general public would walk away just from listening to the album so it feels like there was an agenda to almost do that because i can't imagine that everyone would just get up <clears throat> even even okay even if it wasn't particularly their specific taste but it's michael jackson it's clearly you know it, it is a great album so it it does give elements of sounding a bit orchestrated that to me, I just it doesn't seem natural that everyone would just get up and walk out and say not a thing. So it does feel like that's the real beginning of, of things sort of turning um, with the recording executives. It has a bit of a mob. I, I get a bit of a mob vision when I hear that story, you know, like all these, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many of them there were, but all these guys kind of coming in sitting down in their suits being very probably quite intimidating which you know it is you've got people there who are essentially judging your work and then um yeah to just kind of get up and leave i just yeah 
I, I, the, the image that I conjure up with, with that is, is not a good one at all. Just on a bit of a hand, <laughs> just in the book. I was about to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the same thing. It's, yeah, it's the setup of all the microphones for the recording and smile. And it's just interesting because it's got all the instruments and showing you exactly which microphone. So obviously Nicole and I picked out exactly the same page on that. So it's some interesting, <laughs> interesting things there. On a happier note, because that other one is... It's just, it is a horrible story and it's, you really feel for him. And also, I think that really obviously stood out in Bruce's mind. Um, yeah. So he obviously got, he, you know, got, and I, again, I feel that he maybe has a lot more understanding of all that than he, and he doesn't write about it just from the, again, the lack of what he says, but the little bit that there is wherever it was somewhere saying it about. Was in, it, I'm pretty sure that was in the Silent Giants. Right. And so, so if you want to hear what we're talking about, then go and listen to that. But yeah, he does say one very short quote, but it is quite damning. And um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, he just, He's also noted it being very good at sort of how to handle these executives. I think a few people sort of quote, quote that about Bruce. Um, and I think that's probably just that he didn't bother with them too much. Um, it was probably just respectful in what he needed to do. But, you know, that wasn't really who he wanted to deal with particularly. But I think the lack of what's said speaks yeah. more volumes with Bruce. I don't think he's someone to really drag up the negative. Uh, Nicole, did you want to add anything to history before we move on to our um, fourth discussion point? Uh, I just had one note um, under my history section where I've, um, Bruce mentions that um, you can sacrifice technical for music, but not the other way around. So that, you know, obviously that goes to his saying music first, but that sometimes, you know, the technical rules can be thrown out for the sake of the music, but you can't throw the music out for the sake of the technical. Yeah makes perfect sense yeah it was kind of like regardless of how much he liked to play around and he liked to experiment if it was at at the cost of of the sound of the music you know just to kind of get something in there for the sake of it then you know he wasn't about doing that and obviously that's why his music was amazing um okay so bruce on michael and kind of their relationship that they built up i mean there were so many adjectives um, that mm. were used by Bruce to describe Michael. Um, he was the consummate artist. He was always totally prepared when he came to the studio. He never had to read the words of the music off the page. He would be up the night before we recorded, learning the lyrics that he could do from memory. He is unquestionably a survivor, the most accomplished, most professional artist I've ever worked with. A gentle soul, very polite, always saying please and thank you. Uh, there is no one I'd rather, I'd rather work with. And um, Michael's musical standards are incredibly high. I mean, you know, he just can't really um, speak highly enough of Michael. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how much Michael spoke out about or, or wrote about um, Bruce Redeem, but I mean, I'm sure the, the feeling was very much mutual. But it's just lovely to have as part of this book, yes, it's it's in parts it's a very technical book, but in in most parts it's just very it's very basic and it's very full of sort of Bruce's emotions, both for music and, and for the for the people that he worked with. And Michael for sure, I mean he said, you know, that he's the one person um, that he, you know, most love to, to work with really um yeah so what did you guys pick up on on bruce's feelings towards michael yeah i've got um a quote i think it might have been from the silent giants one um it, it's kind of a bit broken because i think the interviewer slightly steps in at a few points but he it, it sort of reiterates again what you've just said there it says i wish we could have michael here now you'd be amazed how ordinary how polite well dressed just incredible guy i think michael and quincy i truly love those guys i'm an only child i've never had a brother or sister and he gets kind of cut off but he does say in the book he talks about them being his brothers and he's like i mean in a, a family way um you know that that's how he saw them and i think 
um, the part about the polite as well. He, he does emphasise, as you said, that he said the please and thank yous. And he said in an industry where that doesn't really happen, um, you know, so he does really impre- it, it, you know, appreciate him. And he, another quote he said in, I think it was in that um, podcast, was that Michael was powerful in a kind way. Um, but yeah, I, I, something for Michael's legacy, I think, in this book is that it's a very honest book. It's a technical book, but it's very, very clear um, how much he thought of Michael, both at the professional way. You know, he said he reiterates a number of times that um, he always came to the studio prepared. He always knew his lyrics. It didn't matter if he had to stay up all night. What I found interesting, I think if you look earlier in Michael's career in recording in Jackson's, he is sometimes singing from the sheets. But obviously by the time he got to the recordings with Bruce, he got to that point where he always then um, rehearsed his his lyrics and and knew them beforehand. Um, But he obviously, he really admires that how professional he was with that and the fact that he says that um, he always did his uh, vocal training so um uh, we i think we all listened to a session that was from seth riggs and we'll post that as well that you can find on his website of them doing the vocal training and he said it wasn't just before he sang it was every time he went up to the mic he would do an hour of vocal um vocal warm-up so i think he really appreciated his professional side but he he saw who he was And one thing that's nice is nothing about allegations or anything comes into any of Bruce at the book or any of his discussions because I think he knows that is not him. So he doesn't even bring it up because he, you could tell he knew who he was and um, understood him as a person and an artist. So it doesn't even come into question which I think is nice because it, it comes into too many things, really. I actually had written down the exact same quotes that you mentioned from um, the book and the um, Silent Giants one because obviously they stand out and you do get that same sentiment everywhere from the book. And, and But just to add a couple of things that I um, got from, um, well, first of all, the, the Vinyl Nights, podcast which is the one with the the drummer J.R. Robinson Um, and in one part they actually play rock with you because um, J.R. was the drummer and obviously Bruce worked on rock with you and when they came back all Bruce said was oh you're going to have me in tears now and you could hear him choke up a little bit and you can just you could tell that he was obviously you know starting to cry almost and they asked him about Michael and, and all he could say was oh he was something else like that that were the only words he had for him it was quite an emotional little moment because you can just without even saying many words he, you could you could just feel the love that he had for him and I think those same sentiments come across in uh, Thriller and Beyond the Sale Uni Lecture which is essentially just um, the video on YouTube is just um, the the audience which are mostly made up of engineering students all get to ask him questions and through through many questions he's asked about michael um and in on most occasions if it's a technical question he can speak to that quite quite well without getting emotional but if he actually has to talk about michael the person he he gets teary every time and it's um one of the things he says um well, they asked. They actually asked him at one point um, what what music inspired him, and all he can think to say is is to talk about Michael. And he says, "Well, after you've worked with Michael, it's hard to work with anyone else." Which I thought that was a a nice little tribute. And then he also says um, that he feels blessed to have met him and to have done his recordings. So yeah, that that emotion certainly does shine through. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. Yeah, with you playing that, I'm feeling the same because when I watch that, I think it's the full sale one. And he, again, like you just said in that other podcast where he got choked up, it did make me cry because it was just like, well, oh, you could feel his emotion as soon as he just said, oh, that guy, man, that guy. And he's just like, oh. and you can tell he's just trying to hold it in. Um, yeah. It's very, very touching. Very touching. One of the, the things that I really liked to book, about the book was um, actually not only what Bruce had to say on Michael, but um, so many people that were involved in Michael's life and his work wrote um, 
sort of extracts for the book um you know about their kind of experiences with michael so we had a really lovely story from b um where she talks about um I, i'm assuming she's uh, referring to 3t who had just lost their mum and uh, one of one of them it doesn't say who but one of them was in the studio with michael and um you know obviously michael felt him he's kind of working and, and he's this, this boy is just kind of on his own really michael felt he needed children um his age around him so he arranged for a family that he knew to come to new york for a few days and he put them all up in a first class hotel and he sent them to um you know a big toy store in, in america for the day all expenses paid and arranged a christmas party with santa everyone was invited and I think those are, you know we've heard similar stories before but i think those sort of stories are are so special and really kind of again show who who michael is and what he was about um i also loved the story by russ ragsdale um about you know being so nervous about meeting michael for the first time and being sort of in in a room alone with him and they were kind of stood, I think they were stood across this table. They, they went to go and get food and there's like all this food laid out for them. And they're sort of alone in this room and Russ is really nervous and they're both just kind of standing there not saying anything. And then uh, Michael just like grabs a handful of corn and throws it at Russ. And then mm -hmm. Russ kind of throws something back and then they kind of have this little food fight. And, you know, Michael's obviously done that to kind of break the ice and make things kind of less um less awkward for him so and he actually he's quoted as saying in the book i wish there were more people in the world exactly like michael jackson and i think that says says a lot too yeah um okay let's go on to our last point where we are talking about um bruce's legacy <laughs> so what is bruce's legacy I think, I mean, obviously within the recording industry and in his field, he is certainly, he's the Michael Jackson in that, in that field. And you can see that from all the people interviewing him. He is known as a legend. So I, I think obviously in his field, uh, that is really part of his, his legacy. And obviously he's been part of making the biggest selling album um so he have, has all of that and then there's all the bits where the the blue oh, i'm gonna say it wrong blue line pair and that with the microphones he's got legacy with that and um i think it's with bill putnam who was obviously one of his influencers bill and him were the first people to create a sonic picture so they've sort of got that as well they were the first first ones to come up with a sonic picture for the music so i think he's got an incredible legacy and some of it might not know, be known to the wider public because it's more on the technical side but um he's certainly through thriller he's known more widely than he might have otherwise been known i kind of i wrote down a few points um from all the different mentors oh sorry the those that he mentored so the ones that were the the younger engineers and you know they all say very similar things that you could um sort of summarize in a list of his his amazing generosity in sharing all of his um, his knowledge that you know that motto of no secrets. Uh, he taught them to be emotionally involved in the music. He was patient. He embraced the new, and he taught them how to put love in the mix. And I think all of that ha is essentially you know, and that's what he's left behind in the younger gen in the younger engineers. So that's become part of his legacy in that way. And I really like Phil O'Keefe. Um, in the in the book he says that bruce's legacy is um that the engineer is a sympathetic co-artist which i quite i quite liked that quote as well yeah phil also said um i've never met anyone who was more interested in passing it on to the next generation of cats than bruce bruce has no secrets and he is actively involved with sharing his experiences and knowledge to those who are just learning the art and craft of making records and obviously we've um, referred to the full sale university talks and i know that he was a regular um, speaker there and he'd sort of go and answer questions from people that were studying this field um, and um, yeah i mean he's just had such an impact on 
on so many. Um, Arjun Bose says, whenever I record a song and start mixing, I have the sonic soundscape of Thriller right in my mind. If you take away the songs that he recorded, Bruce recorded and mixed, a huge part of our musical history gets deleted and there's little left after that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the book itself, without kind of listening to other documentaries or podcasts, the book itself speaks volumes really of Bruce and, and what people um, thought of him and how people see him and, and how revered he is. Um, to people, to specifically to people who, who are in the, the field of recording music. Um, one of the quotes that I really liked from Quincy, which wasn't directly about Bruce, but I think is very relevant to talking about Bruce's legacy. He said, having just traveled around the entire world three times, I've witnessed in every country the results of our collaboration that took place over 25 years ago, as I constantly hear the songs being played. They are always played right along with all the chart topping records of today and always during the peak hours of radio. Um, and, you know, I think that kind of sums it up quite nicely, really. Bruce has had a huge impact on the world, actually, because not just in the people that work in that field, but the people who are buying these songs and these albums and these records, you know, it's, it's had a huge Im impact on, on our lives. Um, as Michael Jackson fans, so um, yeah, I think that a lot of people have a lot to to thank him about. Um, the, uh, sorry. No, sorry, Nicole, go please. I was just going to add. In the, um, Brad Sundberg just did his podcast as a tribute to to Bruce, and in there he he speaks a bit about um, Bruce as a scientist. And he makes a point of making sure people don't take that as a derogatory in a derogatory way. But um, he talks obviously that that is a testament to his knowledge and his technical side. Um, but then he goes on to talk about how he brought more to it than just the science. And somewhere I can't remember where I think it's in one of the podcasts. Bruce himself actually says you can't reduce music recording to just a science. And again, that's testament to the to what to everything that he did bring to the table, um, and I think that's part of his legacy as well. The fact that he was so technical, such a scientist, but also able to bring the emotion in as well, and that that creative emotional side is what made the music even greater than how he'd already made it with the technical side. It all blended together, and I guess that's why. Um, the term king of sound is so fitting. Absolutely. And if anyone um, he lives or is going to visit Minneapolis soon, um, the old movie theatre on Nicolet Avenue that him and his father bought and converted into a recording studio in 1954 is still there. It's called Creative Audio. So um, that's another little legacy that he's left behind. Okay, so overall opinions of the book. I mean, obviously, I think we've spoken highly enough of it already, but um, for me personally, as I said at, at the start, and I feel like I'm kind of doing a full circle here, um, I was really intrigued to read this book, but I was a bit concerned because I, I'd heard from a few different sources that it was a very technical book, and I thought, oh, this is going to kind of go way over my head. But probably out of the sessions that we've done so far, this is, this is the book that I've made the most notes on. I feel like I've learned a hell of a lot from this book, things that I didn't know before and things that actually I was really interested in. Um, you know, am I going to go and necessarily look into or study um, sound engineering further? No, I don't think I have the, the brain capacity to do that, unfortunately. But, you know, what I have found out, I've, I've been really interested by and, um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot more about Michael, which, um, you know, as fans is always a, a kind of goal for us. Um, and I know that Betty Lou wrote in to say exactly the same. She wasn't sure if she'd like the book, but really enjoyed. And um, as I said earlier, she really enjoyed the opportunity that the book gave her to be that kind of fly in the wall in the studio and, and kind of hear and, and about and visualize those, those stories that were told. Um, Nicole, how about you? Um, I, I loved the sort of journey that I've been on in the last month, learning about um, Bruce through the book and through the documentaries and podcasts. Um, 
I, I enjoyed the opportunity to learn a bit more about the recording process. I, I feel like before this last month, I was a bit of ignorant to it all. <laughs> now that I know a bit more, I feel I was a bit too ignorant before because um, I just have this new appreciation for, for all the technology, all the technical side of it, the science of, of music recording. And I'm, I'm glad I've, I've, I've spent that time to, to learn a little bit about that. And it's obviously given me an appreciation for that process and for, for Bruce's amazing talents in that way. I loved reading about what Bruce thought of, of Michael Jackson. And then also it does, without specifically stating it, it does highlight the similarities between them. So you can really see, um, you know, that love of animals, that, that philosophy of music first and perfectionism and all of those things. Um, and also just that love of, mucking around and having a fun time um you can see from what we know about michael that they would have had a great connection and obviously they must have done because from the moment they started working together they they continued to work on every album together um, and so it was really nice to to read about that and, and sort of see those connections um, and i have one quote um from um it's actually from the Silent Podcasts, um, the Silent Giant Podcast, sorry, uh, that kind of, I think, sort of sums up um, Bruce to a T. And that's, after a while, all the memories blur together and I just remember being happy in the studio. Oh. That's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Angie, what about you? What did you feel yeah. about the book? Um, similar to both of you, it um, was a, a journey. I actually, I think all three of us have in common that we like to learn things. So actually the technical side, it was still really interesting because I did learn a lot of it like you. I don't think I'm going to go off and be a recording engineer, but do you know what? How, had I have read a book like this when I was younger, it, it possibly could have taken me down a different path. And I think... It's, a, it's really nice that it's a book. It isn't just for Michael Jackson fans, it is for people in this industry. And I think that's great because then it ties Michael's talent into that. So it brings him back into um, a legacy for anybody who's gonna go in and read this from that point of view. It's got great little stories. I think what you just said, Nicole, with that bit about, oh, you know, the memories and just generally being happy. I think that's where, I would have loved some more stories in some of the later albums, you know, a few more stories in there, but I think that's possibly part of it is, yes, his, his memories aren't as clear on every individual thing. And you can see that later in life where he needs to be a bit more. So maybe he doesn't remember all the individual stories, but it is a lovely uh, tale. And I just think he's just such a lovely man. You really, really warm to him and who he is through his stories. And even just I noticed from the front cover, and I just, I feel like in some regards, he's got a lot in connection with Michael. There's a photo, it's very similar to this, but actually Bruce is facing forwards and I felt like he's used this one because he's not worried about him being forward and centre. He's quite humble. It's more about showing Michael and Quincy on this than himself because that's the side shot. And there is a photo where he actually is better shown on it. And I thought that, that's quite typical of him because he, like Michael, was humble and about his gifts. I think he is in his field. I think he's kind of the Michael Jackson in his field and he is, is just a kind, big hearted guy, very intelligent, really knows his stuff, but also, uh, you know, allows the creative side and that kind of where they said, leave the room for God to walk through the room. It's that kind of similar thing to Michael. So there's all that hard work, craft and knowledge there, but also just a letting, I don't know, nature, everything sort of take its course as well. I, I, brilliant book. I really enjoy it. Um, and there's, you know, the, the author is, is obviously Bruce himself. I have a massive appreciation for him, much more than I ever did. I remember always seeing his name on vinyl liner notes. And I, know, I knew there was a picture of him. He was a big guy, but I didn't really have an appreciation for exactly what he bought to it all and I think now I really do and I feel it's a shame now to learn so much about him when now he's gone because I would have liked to have sort of seen and heard more or got that opportunity and like the book club I, it would be lovely if they'd got the opportunity to to interview him so really really good guy really brilliant book 
Great. So um, next month, um, you need to put the 3rd of January, which is a Sunday, um, into your diaries for the next um, session. So we are recording in December, but obviously with all the festive period come up, coming up, we found it quite hard to, to find a, a, um, appropriate broadcast date. So we've decided on Sunday, the 3rd of January. And as you already know, we've decided to um, study this one. We thought it'd be a nice kind of light read um, for the Christmas period. So um, I actually haven't read this yet and I know many fans have. And again, it tends to be one of the favorites that keeps coming up um, on the group. So I'm really super excited to read this one. It's a nice thick one with lots of pictures to read um, over the month of December. Um, and otherwise that's it from us. Is there anything that anybody would like to say just to um, close this session? No, I just really enjoyed it. Yes. Thank you for joining us um, again and hopefully we'll see you next month. <laughs>